usually bar shoes are very common in the shoeing practice and I'm not sure if I can give you a lot of new facts, but uh, I would like to give you some communication skills. Yeah, so sometimes I think in particular veterinarians, they don't really know about bar shoes. Yeah, usually they know more or less one bar shoe, usually egg bar shoe, and that's it. And then they try to make a suggestion which shoe you should choose and actually they don't have a clue. So if you use bar shoes, you should be able to explain why yeah, and you should also be able to defend if you say, no, I don't want to use this type of bar shoes because I think uh, another one is better. There are so many different types of bar shoes. I just uh, choose a few, maybe more or less the most common, but I think everybody of you know that you can create the bar shoes in so many different versions that we can't co couldn't cover everything. But uh, the length of the bar, the width of the bar, the position of the bar, everything makes a very, very big uh, difference how the shoeing is affecting your, the hoof and also the horse. Yeah, And you should be able to explain it. I think that's something in the modern farriery, you should be able to communicate. So you should be able to know what are the shoes doing and what is maybe good and what is maybe a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> I try to find a good uh, way to differentiate the different bar shoes. So I think you could say we have the shoes, the bar shoes, which are creating more surface in the inside of the hoof. So not extending the hoof capsule. So we increase or change, let's say increase and change the supporting surface of the hoof, usually in the past palmar region. Yeah, so that's one type of bar shoes. And then we have a different type of bar shoes with a palmar extension. So, and I think both types can be created very different. How is that? You can create the bars very, very, yeah, in a very different way, depending what you would like to achieve. But in general, it doesn't matter how you create the bar, you have the bar shoes increasing supporting surface and you have the bar shoes giving more palmar extension. And now we start with the bar shoes <clears throat> giving a little bit more uh, supporting area. And usually we have yeah, these types of bar shoes. How I said, you can make the bars shorter or longer or create them different. But in general, if you change the load distribution at the hoof capsule, you try to relieve a specific part of the hoof capsule. And usually you do it if you have any kind of disorder affecting the hoof capsule itself. So that can be laminitis where you would like to bring all the load, all the weight in the past. You can have, for example, hoof cracks or crushed heels, or if you have any kind of lesion or injury at the hoof capsule, you would like to um, relief. Yeah, so we can conclude that all kind of bar shoes increasing supporting area in the palmar region change the load distribution at the hoof capsule. More or less, not more, yeah, for the beginning now. Um, so we have uh, various indications. So now we should uh, think about how to create a bar shoe inside the hoof capsule to relieve specific parts of the hoof. Yeah. And this is always something you should be on mind. Yeah, not all types of disorders need the same type of bar shoes or the same application of bar shoes. Yeah, uh, I just try to highlight it in, in this way. So usually if you start here in the middle, you can put the whole weight equally on the frog and the heels. So frog and heels are loaded equally. Usually you can yeah, achieve it with a pets packing combination and the bar. But then you can also relieve the bar. Yeah, so if you would like to relieve the bar, you have to put the pressure on the heels. So then you have to create the bar in a way that you don't have pressure or load on the frog. Yeah. Or the opposite, you can also create bars and you can also position bars and yeah, combine it with pads and packings to put more load at the heels, uh, more load on the bar to relieve the heels. Yeah. So you have three types or the three applications of bar shoes inside the hoof capsule with different actually indications. Yeah. So I would like to give you some case reports or examples. 
So just very short, it's not that I would like to make a big thing out of it, but just a few examples. In laminitic courses in particular, if you have a chronic laminitis, usually you have a rotated or founded or end founded and a destroyed dorsal area of the hoof capsule. So you would like to relieve this area. So you put all the weight, all the load here in the palmar region. Yeah, usually you can achieve it quite good if you choose a medium firm cushion in the whole palmar hoof half and then you use a soft plastic pad to have a more or less good shock absorption and relief of the uh, dorsal region of the hoof. Yeah, so that's very simple. I think everybody use this principle. So this is so not very yeah, spe uh, specific, but then <clears throat> we have, for example, polytrochlosis. And sometimes I, in particular, young farriers or some farriers not using bars so often, uh, shoe with a nice bar shoe, uh, uh, horses uh, suffering from polytrochlosis, but then using a too firm packing. So you have too much pressure, uh, pressure from the bar to the frog. And if you watch the anatomy, polytrochlosis affects the navicular bone, the bursa, and the insertion of the deep digital flexor tendon. So in all these structures are located underneath the bar. So as soon as you put too much pressure on the bar, you will affect the disease to navicular region. Yeah, and this is actually something we don't want. So in these cases, the bar is actually just a protection of the frog region. Yeah, so it's created maybe with a very soft cushion, almost just a filling. I like to use magic cushion because then you don't have any trash underneath the pad. Yeah, so you can use just a very soft filling uh, that you don't have dirt or anything you don't want to have between the pad and the uh, hoof. And then you can use a firm plastic pad or leather just to protect or that just to have a protection of the frog region. Yeah, or you can, if it's uh, not necessary to have a pad or packing, you can just create the bar, but make sure that it don't put pressure on the frog. Yeah, because how I said, here the red triangle is just representing the frog. Yeah, you would directly put pressure on the sensitive and diseased navicular region, and you don't want it. <clears throat> the opposite is if you have quarter cracks or crushed heels or something uh, diseased in the heel region, then you actually use a medium firm cushion at the frog. Yeah, may more or less as firm as you can do. And then you can use a bar just to put more pressure on the frog. Yeah, of course, you could also just place the bar on the frog with a lot of pressure, but this is very firm. Yeah, so I don't like this solution that much. I must say, actually, I always prefer a little bit more frog support pads. But if you would like to use a bar, still try to use a packing maybe a little bit more stiffer packing and the pet to avoid pressure peaks. Yeah, but this is a way you could relieve the heel region and it's a nice and I think very useful and helpful way to relieve quarter cracks and make them growing normal. <clears throat> yeah, so just look, uh, just let's look on some biomechanics. I will show you now, as Mehmet said, some uh, findings from the also kid study. So we just used uh, 25 horses. We shot them or we measured them barefoot and shot with a standard shoe and then we shot them with different modification also with different bar shoes and one was the hard bar shoe and then we measured the horses on four different grounds one ground was for example deep sand so the horses were really sinking into the sand that means we could also measure the yeah, effect of different grounds on the shoes then we had two uh, sensor foils so one sensor was attached on the shoe itself. So we could measure between shoe and ground. And a second sensor, like a sandwich, was positioned between shoe and hoof. So but the technique is not so interesting today. So I would just like to show you the images. This is now the image from the sensor on the hoof, uh, on the shoe itself. So we just see that the whole hoof is sinking into, into the ground. We see the bar is supporting the palmar region. So these pressure images are averaged from seven strides and dark blue is less or very low pressure and the lighter and the more colored it gets, uh, the more pressure is affecting the region. It goes up to red, so it's a rainbow scale, so red pressure peaks are really high and sensitive pressure. So, but now it's actually interesting what is given 
from the shoe to the hoof. So the same shoe, hopper shoe on uh, sand. And now we see that the bar was attached or was uh, connected to the frog. And still we see some small pressure peaks here at the heels. This is quite typical for any kind of bar shoes. It increases usually pressure peaks on the heels. The more the frog is involved into weight bearing, the less pressure peaks we have. But due to the fact that the palmar support limits the sinking of the hoof into the ground, we have a little bit more resistance on the ground in the palmar region. So it creates a little bit more pressure peaks. And the second is usually the bar shoes lock a little bit the hoof mechanism. So the lateral movement of the heels. So the vertical forces we are measuring here, the vertical forces are not really distributed by lateral movement of the heel. So the shock absorption is a little bit limited. So we see some small pressure peaks in any kind of bar shoes. Yeah. The interesting of the hard bar shoe is that you can use it as a kind of filter of the ground reaction forces. So this is the image on sand. And now we compare it with the image on uh, concrete, so on stone, yeah? And you could see it's not so different, yeah? So still the frog is a little bit loaded and still we have more or less the same picture. So I would like to go to this fact a little bit more. So here we have the same horse shot with a standard shoe, yeah? And then the same horse shot with a hard bar shoe. And you can see the bar is here loading the frog a little bit more. And you can see that it's also changing the pressure distribution a little bit. And the second thing is on penetrable ground like sand, for example, usually the palmar region sinks also into the ground and the frog region is loaded. So if you are, if you have any kind of dirt or any kind of soft material, it will load the frog if you have a standard horseshoe or barefoot hoof. If you compare the image of the hard bar shoe also on sand, it's the same load, more or less the same load of the frog region than on firm ground. So this bar is actually kind of protection. Yeah? So if you have a horse suffering from prolotrohlosis, it is actually nice to always have the same load and the same controlled load on the frog region. Yeah? So these horses maybe don't like to have too much pressure on uh, dirt or on penetrable ground. So it's nice if you apply the frog in the, way, uh, the bar in the way you need. And then you have a kind of filter of the complete load of the navicular region or the frog region. Yeah. <clears throat> but I would like to highlight also something else. So now we have the comparison between the hard bar shoe and the egg bar shoe created without uh, frog contact. Yeah, you can see it in the image, it's the same horse. Yeah, so here you have the hard bar shoe with loading the frog more or less neutral. And then you have the uh, egg bar shoe without frog contact. So you see we have high pressure peaks at the heels. It's also a rule or uh, a principle. Whenever you decrease the weight bearing area, you still have the same forces affecting a, a, a smaller weight bearing area. So less weight bearing area, same forces, creation of uh, pressure peaks. So this is something you should be aware of whenever you modify a shoe, if you take weight bearing surface of the hoof or the shoe away, the forces have to go somewhere so you will create pressure peaks. Yeah? In this way, the frog is not loaded, so the heels are affected by pressure peaks. This can be, the, how I said, the indication to unload the frog is maybe useful. The side effects, like loading the heels, over time damaging the heels. So Mitch Taylor one time said uh, bar shoes have a kind of wedge effect on the um, heels. So usually after a while the heels are destructed or a little bit destroyed, becomes weaker. You see the collapsed frogs. So it is always a good idea to change the concept whenever you see the heels are not able to stay the load anymore. As usually it's a nice way to work with pads and packings. A very specific bar shoe is the open toe shoe. I just choose it because I think it belongs somehow to the family of the bar shoes. It's a shoe actually created to relieve the dorsal part or the actually the toe of the hoof. Yeah, for example, in laminitic horses, it is more or less often used. The breakovers also set a little bit to the palmar or to the plantar. And then you have load of the 
drop in the palmar region. The problem is a little bit, you're in particular in motion during breakover, you create, or the uh, end of the branches here create high pressure peaks underneath the end of the branches and the yeah, more or less sensitive area of the toe region of the hoof. Yeah, so we also see it here in the image uh, of the hoof. You can see you have pressure peaks underneath the end of the branches. Although the frog is loaded, this hoof is actually not really, the, let's say the load distribution is not really well. Even yellow pressure peaks are so high that it's actually, yeah, at least not comfortable for the horse. Yeah, sometimes it's also damaging, but it's uh, not comfortable. Yeah, and then you imagine there's a very sensitive thin sole, so these horses will not walk with uh, with open toe shoes very well. And if you have a founder or a horse suffering from laminitis, I'm quite sure this is not a good shoeing option. So I'm very critical with uh, open toe shoes because of the pressure peaks and also some other things. But uh, you should be in mind, if you would like to apply a, a bar, um, open toe shoe, you really should take care that you don't create pressure peaks. Yeah, so I have two examples. So this was a client I just uh, met for the first time a while ago. It was shot with a, yeah, let's say with an open toe shoe, but you see the farrier just uh, cut part of the toe section of the shoe out. And now we just have here really sharp and really uh, pressure creating ends of the branches. So this, this was, was very uncomfortable, so was not really able to walk and you could really see bruises here underneath the end of the branches. So this is definitely not the way we would like to apply an open toe shoe. I like to, if I have to do it, it's very, very rare that I use it, but I made a dorsal wall resection here in the lower image and I really forged and grinded sole relief and a very gentle and smooth uh, transition to break over and I used uh, packing and pet to avoid any kind of um, pressure peak here in this sensitive region. Yeah, So this is a way you can create a kind of uh, open toe shoe, which maybe support or is useful for your indication, but be careful that you don't create pressure peaks. <clears throat> if you're not really sure if the horse can stay the load uh, change or if some regions are not really able to bear it, you can always test it. You can use the hoof tester or what I would like to do. I'm not using wood anymore. I usually just uh, use a piece of the thick plastic pads and then I just tape it underneath the region I would like to put load on. I let the horse stand on it so, and walk on it so I can see if it can stay the load or if it's maybe too much, at least short term. Yeah, so but at, at least it's better better than nothing. So I would just recommend if you make severe load changes, just try it uh, in advance. Bar shoes also affect the toe axis. Yeah, so let's say from hard bar, egg bar and open toe, the whole, uh, toe axis gets steeper and steeper and penetrable ground. Yeah, since we create more surface in the palmar region and the shoe is, uh, the hoof is actually designed with the toe, yeah, so with a more or less small toe and then a wider part in the palmar region. So usually all hoofs have the tendency in steep or uh, penetrable ground to have a steeper orientation. The more surface we create in the palmar region, the steeper the hoof is standing on penetrable or let's say soft ground. Yeah. Usually the toe angle changes about one to five degree. So open toe shoes and egg bar shoes usually come very close to five degrees. So this can be uh, an effect. Yeah, so you, it might be that you would like to have it. Yeah, maybe if you have some problems with the uh, navicular region, then it's also nice if they stand a little bit more steep in soft ground, but it can be also a side effect. So I had once a uh, horse coming to me, it was bought by a new person. It was a dressage horse and the vet decided, I don't know for what reason, that the horse needed a little bit more palmar support and recommended an egg bar shoe. So then the horse was bought, it became egg bar shoes, and then it was trained for six weeks, of course, in quite soft ground. And after six weeks, it had a severe um, suspensible ligament injury. So yeah, now is the question, and it actually was a nice examination before it was bought. There was nothing yeah, very strange in the suspensory ligament before it was bought. I think it was just, they showed me videos, it was due to the palmar support, very steep and soft ground. 
and the suspensive ligament was just suffering from it and the high training frequency and intensity was creating this problem. So be aware that you also change the toe position in soft ground if you apply a brush. Yeah, just to show you some videos, I hope it works and that you can see it. But this is uh, just what I would wanted to tell you in stance, the same in walk or in dynamics. Yeah, in soft ground, uh, the open toe shoe is much steeper. The hoof with the open toe shoe is much steeper than the hoof with a standard shoe and would be the same with a hard bar shoe and egg bar shoe. I just uh, have this one video here for, as an example, but you can see in the dynamics, it's the same. Um, so if you look at locomotion pattern, the good news are whenever you apply a bar shoe uh, inside the hoof capsule or whenever you change the weight bearing area inside the hoof capsule, you don't have an effect on the locomotion pattern of the horse. Here we see three horses. So all three horses with a standard shoe in the upper row. So you see um, the little more black, more or less black line. So the beginning of the line is the landing or the initial contact, then it's the landing phase, then you have mid stance, and then it starts to break over and the black white box is the point of breakover. So we have left hoofs. These, uh, the first two hoofs have, or the first two horses have at the left hoof a lateral landing. The third horse has a medial landing. Yeah, but anyway, you see a straight bar shoe, a hard bar shoe, or even a white toe shoe, it's not a bar shoe, but any type of shoe changing the weight bearing area inside the hoof capsule is not affecting the locomotion pattern, not in known of the 25 horses. Yeah, the only thing what is critical, now you see the open toe shoe again, you see the horse walking on firm ground. And what you could see where it's stops now, in mid stance, the distal phalanx, the tip of the distal phalanx is sinking between the branches because the missing support of the dorsal part of the hoof. Yeah, so if you have, this was actually a normal hoof, but if you have a horse suffering from laminitis with a rotation or with very thin hoofs or thin soles, yeah, due to the missing support of the dorsal aspect of the toe, the distal phalanx and the sole miss some support there and you have a sinking of the distal phalanx, and this is very uncomfortable for sensitive horses. So again, it can be a little bit avoided if you use uh, pads. If you use an uh, open toe shoe with pads, you often see that you have a kind of bump yeah, after a while in the region of the toe. <coughs> so if we conclude uh, the effects or the, the wanted effects, of bar shoes changing the supporting surface, we can easily relieve diseased regions. Yeah, we can control the effect of the ground reaction forces on specific areas of the hoof, and we create a steeper toe axis on penetrable ground. So this is actually what bar shoes are doing inside the hoof capsule. Yeah. Side effects, more or less unintended side effects, is that we, of course, if we change, if you, how I said, if you um, relief one region, we might be overloading the supported region, so the frog or the heels depends where you put more weight on. In general, we increase weight. This is also something if you use a, yeah, let's say, white or big bar, yeah, then you have, of course, more weight. If you add pad and packing, we increase the weight of the hoof. This usually increases instabilities, and we have higher shock and vibration during landing, and it's more difficult for the horse to stabilize the limb during swing phase. Yeah, this is something you should bear in mind. Any kind of bar shoes might be very heavy. Also, the steeper toe angulation on penetrable ground might be not wanted, and often we can have the risk that we narrow the hoofs if we create the bar shoes in a not very well design. Okay. Then we switch to the bar shoes with the palmar extensions. So usually here for my, or let's say in my experience and from my uh, research findings, indications are injuries of the deep digital flexor tendon and the superficial flexor tendon, lesions of the suspensory ligament, tendon laxity or missing stability of the fetlock or any horse needing support in the fetlock region. So if you make a palmar extension, usually we have or we see afterwards less extension in the fetlock joint, so we can relieve the structures of the 
suspensory apparatus of the fetlock joint. Yeah. So we know this principle actually from folds. If you have a fold with tendon laxity, you just glue a shoe with a panel support and immediately, directly after gluing, you have less extension and a good bearing and a good support of the fetlock and the horse is able or the foal is able to stand straight. Yeah. And if the principle works with foals, of course, it also works with adult horses. So again, uh, and I would like to repeat the structures of the uh, suspensory apparatus of the fetlock joint. So we not just have the deep digital flexor tendon and the superficial flexor tendon and the suspensory ligament. We also have the annular ligaments and the sesamoid ligaments. Yeah, so we have a very complex apparatus. And usually <clears throat> if one structure is damaged and you have a breakdown, usually the other structures are following step by step. Yeah. Like here in particular, if you have horses working really hard on firm ground or you have sport horses, athletes, yeah, you know how much the fetlock is an extension if they have if you have the maximum bearing. And also these horses might benefit if you apply a kind of palmar extension, palmar support. Yeah, but be careful how I said the toe axis change, the steeper orientation might be also a problem. And I would like to highlight some manufacturing details of the bars that you can avoid a steeper orientation of the hoofs with the palma extension on soft ground. <clears throat> so here you have a horse with a rupture of the, of the deep digital flexor tendon um, proximal to the fetlock joint. You see it because the tip of the hoof is pointing upwards. So of course the DDFT is ruptured and after shoeing it with a egg bar shoe with a quite long palmar extension, the horse is able to load the limb straight and to have a good stability in the fetlock joint. Of course, here it would be very crucial or very difficult if this horse would stand steeper in a penetrable ground. So for example, the horse is going on the soil or in the box or wherever. So you would like to avoid a steeper orientation of the deep of the ditch of the toe, sorry, because then it would definitely again missing the stability and the support and it would break down again. One, um, one way to avoid a steeper orientation the hoofs with bar shoes on penetrable ground is to use a pad. If you use a pad, it's just standing on the ground. So nothing is sinking in actually. Yeah, so this that's something you can use to avoid a steeper orientation on penetrable ground. That's why we used here the pad and the horse is very, very comfortable and is walking very good. Then um, you have the uh, injury of the superficial deep digital flexor tendon. So here we just use, or I just used a, yeah, let's say similar version, but a thinner bar because it's a very fine horse. I don't want to have too much extension. And I combined it with a wedge shoe, yeah, with, a, with a wedge pad. Yeah, so you have actually two things. You have a palmar support and you have a little bit more heel elevation to relieve the tendon. And then you can see the horse standing before and after. Uh, usually horses not able to bear the weight in the hinds they stand a little bit, so the problem is also in the hinds, yeah. So they stand the limbs very, very much underneath the, the body. And then you have problems in the pelvis and the back as well. So this is actually a whole, yeah, very complex problem. So you need to help the horses to come out of this relief position. So you can just chew it with the palmar extension. You see directly a change in posture. And then you can treat the pelvis in the back and you will have very good results. Yeah, or here another horse with a suspensory ligament lesion, also in the hinds, with a very long bar and also kind of thin bar. Yeah, so usually if they don't have any, if they don't need any toe angle change, and if they walk or work more or less on firm ground, or if they are kept on firm ground for the time of recovery, I don't use a pet. Usually then I just use the bar shoe with a thin bar. The thin bar also avoid a sinking of the palmar hoof region or it's not as much as if you would use a thick bar. So if you would like to have palmar extension, I usually go as much as I can depending on the loss of function. Yeah, the more laxity, the more instability you have, the longer you can create the bars, at least in the hinds. And yeah, once of course it's difficult, but in the hinds you can go as long as you need it. 
and uh, I don't want to have a lot of mess. Yeah, I just want to have the extension so I can just use the very thin bar. This is a shoot from Axel Band as well, or we did it together in the clinic. So here we have a horse suffering from a suspensory ligament uh, lesion, actually here on the right. But uh, since it was pa very painful in the right, the left was actually standing a lot underneath the body. So it missed not just the, the support in the back, uh, in the palmar region, it also missed the support lateral. That's why he or we combined the bar shoe with a trailer, with a lateral trailer. Yeah, so it's a nice combination that you have palmar support and lateral support. And it's nicer than just creating a wide branch shoe because you has, have less um, material and less weight. Yeah, the other side was just shot with a, a bar shoe with a more or less long bar, as long as we could make it. And then, of course, it is a suspensory ligament injury, but still used a wedge pad, so we elevated the heels, we made a heel wedge, and that was why we applied the, or we, we used the wedge, or we used the pad to create an artificial flatter and steeper orientation before we made the shoeing kind of provocation test again. Yeah, and the horse was very, very uncomfortable on the diseased limb with a lower hoof lower hoof angle so we decided since since it was standing and walking very good with a wedge pad to give him a wedge pad so in the end we are shoeing horses not uh, textbooks and this horse was comfortable with a wedge pad yeah this was a quite old mare or a breeding mare not that all but a breeding mare with uh, multiple folds and after the last one it had a complete breakdown of the, the suspension of the fetlock joint because of Whenever horses are in birth or humans or any kind of animals making birth, all the tendons get um, softer and, of course, also the tendons of the limbs. So after a while, all breeding mares often coming lower and lower with the fetlock joint until more or less almost complete breakdown. And here you see the images before shoeing and after shoeing, and you can see with the egg bar shoe the, and also, of course, the trimming. The toe and the fetlock are supported much better and she's able to be a weight. After a while, we changed to uh, extended heel shoes. And you can see the horse more or less uh, now. It at least built some muscles. It will never be a perfect shape, but it built some muscles. It's lame free and it can do a little bit riding work. So this is something you can achieve just by giving some support in the palmar region. Yeah. Well, here, nice. Uh, this is a friend of Guy. <laughs> The horse, he knows very well. We met her, of course, with the injury in the front, but also you can see the hinds are not loaded very well. So it's a little bit under running. So she misses support, but the owner wanted to ride and to train the horse. So we decided to give her some very light bar shoes in the hinds. So we give, gave a very thin bar, a good support, but not a lot of mess. And it's so thin that if the owner is riding, on penetrable ground on soft ground like sand or something, usually the shoes are not really sinking, are uh, really sinking in easily in the soft ground so we don't have a steeper orientation. Yeah, so we can have, we can keep the angle neutral as it would be without the bar and the thin bar still gives enough support as you can see to change the angulation of the fat wall. Yeah, <clears throat> so this would be more or less a shoeing protocol if you use a long bar shoe and then you go back to more or less normal with or without toe angle change. So this is a kind of playing around depending on the recovery and the uh, lesion or the injury of the horse. Yeah, but also here, how I said, we have some side effects. Usually if we don't have a frog support and using egg bar shoes or shoes with palmar extension, we create pressure peaks at the heels. We already said it. Yeah. And we can, if we don't use a thin bar, if we make egg bar shoes with a very wide branch, we usually create also a very steep orientation on soft ground. Yeah, it can be wanted, but can be an unwanted side effect, in particular in sport horses or horses still in training or in training again, it should not be the aim to have a steeper orientation. Yeah. So you can create thinner bars and you can also add maybe a little bit of wider toe that you have a uh, more or less good and neutral position on soft ground. Yeah. So the more surface you have in the toe, the less surface you have in the palmar region, 
the less you have a steeper orientation on soft ground. Yeah. In addition, if you make long and heavy bars, yeah, so egg bar shoes with white bars, it's also sometimes a problem because then you have a forced heel or bar landing yeah, due to the mess in the palmar region. Usually it forces the horses to have a, a bar or heel landing first. Also kind of side effect you should see critical. It depends a little bit on the motion pattern of the original motion pattern of the horse, but it might be a problem. Yeah. For example, this horse actually have a toe landing and with a long and heavy bar in the palmar region, it uh, have a heel landing. We could also uh, prove this result again in our latest study where we compared uh, um, 10 horses with a standard shoe and different shoe modifications. And you could see that usually the horse have actually just a more or less medial or lateral first landing initial contact. And with an egg bar, it's the same shoe, just the um, welding part in there. Then you have here a heel landing, yeah, just because of the leverage, the palmar leverage and the mass. Yeah, you see that the horses uh, with shot with heavy shoes, in particular with bar shoes, heavy bar shoes, they come and shortly before landing, they make a tipping and then the hoof is not stable enough and it's just giving too much um, velocity and then you have a forced heel landing. Yeah. So the conclusion of bar shoes giving palmar extension is that we have less extension in the fetlock joint and more support of this joint so that we can relieve the uh, flexor tendons and the suspensory ligament and the horse can do maybe do the work a little bit easier. The side effect is that we have an increased palmar leverage. Yeah, it can maybe force a heel landing due to, to the weight in the palmar region. The orientation on soft ground is steeper, which might be a problem as well, and it creates pressure peaks at the heels can be a little bit avoided if you use pads and packings and we have an increased weight. Yeah, usually the more dynamic a horse is working, the less weight you should actually apply to the hoof. Yeah, and I think that was a little overview about bar shoes, how I said, I think most of the things you already knew, but uh, maybe it gives you a little bit structure for communication with uh, veterinarians because I'm quite sure that none of the veterinarians know so much about bar shoes. 